That is the sound of the Medics Money financial bleep going off, which means, again, today we are answering questions from doctors just like you. But a bit different today is that all of today's questions come from doctors who came to our talk at the Royal College of Obs and Gynae National Trainees Conference, which we were invited to speak at in Brighton recently. So we are going to be taking questions on, should I invest my kids' junior ISA in cash or shares? We're going to tell you how a pay error could affect your NHS pension. We're going to talk about, is the S&P 500 a globally diversified index tracker? Regressively, there's a lot of insur national insurance questions coming up as well, especially if you have more than one employer. So let's get straight into it. Mate, back on the pod. Well, we've been really, really busy working on our course, which is going amazingly well. First cohort is well underway. So we haven't yeah. done a podcast for absolutely ages together. I think it might be since February. Yeah, it's been a, been a while, hasn't it? I think it's before the before the budget we did one together. Obviously, we've done separate ones since. But uh, yeah, yeah, first time for a little while. How are you? How are things? I love the way you set your kind of time reference on when the budget was. <laughs> I, I don't, I've no idea when the budget was, but I think we last did a podcast before I went on holiday in February. So that's why I'm saying February. I might be wrong. As, as an accountant, I do, I do everything via the budget and the tax year. So that's that's how I operate my, my timing systems. Wouldn't expect anything less, mate. Yeah, things are great. Like I said, we've been working on our course, the Medics Money Financial Wellbeing course. 50 people on the first cohort. Amazing. It's going amazingly well, but it was a lot of work to make and produce. The next cohort is coming up. So if you're interested in coming and learning everything that you need to know to improve your finances, it's at medicsmoney.co.uk forward slash courses, I want to say. It might just be course. Link in the description. But yes, shall we get into it? Because, Let's do it. well, we did an in-person speaking event, which is pretty rare for us. Yeah, we normally do things via, via Zoom or, or obviously podcasts like this, don't we? So yeah, it was, it was quite, um, I have to be honest, I was, it was a bit nerve-wracking to go and do a physical presentation after all this time. Mate, when we turned up, I was kind of hoping we'd be like in a side room or something like that. And they were like, oh, yeah, this is where you're speaking. When I saw that stage, like there was lights, the stage was massive. I don't know. I don't even know how many chairs there were. I was really, really nervous. Yeah, I was I was really paranoid about walking up onto the stage and then falling over. No, that's my, so already I was on, on the, you know, on the back foot thinking, oh, gosh, I'm going to fall over now. Luckily, I didn't. Like. I've never I've never walked up three steps so carefully. Like <laughs> it's like it's covered in ice or snow or something. You're like, oh, I've got to walk really gingerly, like these are fall over. Yeah. So personally, I found the presenting bit pretty nerve wracking. I think, like, yeah, I don't know anyone who wouldn't get really nervous talking up there, but I think both of us, especially nervous, or maybe that's unfair, but I was certainly. So I kind of enjoyed the presenting bit. But the bit I enjoyed most was we finished our presentation. We tried to sneak out the side door and then loads of people came up to us. A, they were podcast fans, which just felt amazing to be helping out our amazing colleagues. B, they asked us some really, really good questions. So we spent about an hour answering questions at the back. And also shout out to the speaker that went on after us, because not only did they tolerate a bit of an informal huddle at the back of the, the theatre, but they also gave Medics Money a shout out. And I think they delivered some really wise words. I think, I can't remember their name and I'm not going to name them either because maybe they don't want it public, but they were at a more seat. They were very senior and that definitely towards the end of their career. And I think they said some really wise words, which were essentially that no one is going to look after your personal finances except you. And if you think that the NHS is going to look after you and owes you a living, then essentially you're wrong. They'd made some really savvy choices in their financial situation uh, and nothing, nothing crazy, just stuff that we preach. And as a result, they were retiring shortly, I think. So that, thanks for that. But should we just get into the questions? Because there were some great it. questions. Am I going first with this investing one? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, go for it. Okay, cool. So somebody asked me, essentially, they wanted to start investing for their children, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, but their question was, I want to get a junior ISA for my kids. Should I get a cash ISA or shall I invest in shares or bonds inside that ISA? So great question. Quick recap. You can have an ISA. You can have a lifetime ISA if you're under the age of 40. And your children can have what's called a junior ISA. And I have a junior ISA for my children. But I think there's some kind of big mistakes that some people are making here. 
Um, so I want to go through those and give you my thoughts on the answer to this question. So if you think about this, when you're asking, what should I do with my money? There's only really two people that can answer that question for you, right? And that is a regulated financial advisor. And of course, you know by now, Medics Money is the best place to find independent expert financial advisors that specialize in doctors. Uh, so that's one way. And the other way is to answer the question yourself, you know, do it yourself. And if you're going to do it yourself, you need to understand investing. And it's really hard to cut through the noise. So we at Medics Money practice what we call evidence-based investing. And hopefully, you know, as doctors, we're used to practicing in an evidence-based way. We don't just guess which treatments to give our patients. Not often, anyway. We use the evidence to work out the best chance of success for our patients. Okay. And that's evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based investing, exactly the same for your investing. You know, this is your future or your kid's future in this scenario. So you don't want to be taking guesses. You don't want to be taking advice from random people on Facebook groups or even random people on YouTube, which is highly ironic because this is going out on YouTube. You need to understand it yourself really, really well. So the only other thing to say is that like, yeah, I can't tell you what to do with your money, but all I can do is show you what the evidence shows. So evidence, piece of evidence number one is this graph, which if you're listening on the podcast, don't worry, I'm going to explain it. And this graph is part of our Medics Money Financial Wellbeing course, and it's from Vanguard data. And what it shows is why cash is not an investment, not advice. <laughs> uh, so it shows that if you put £10,000 in the bank in 1998, by 2022, that cash would be worth about £18,000, okay? But once you've adjusted for inflation, that cash would actually be worth about seven and a half thousand pounds. So ten thousand pounds into the bank in 1998 by 2022 it is actually worth less in real terms than it was in 1998. So if you thought that holding cash in the bank was safe, you know, cash under the mattress, nothing safer. Well, actually, historically speaking, cash has been a terrible way to invest is not an investment in fact it's losing money in real terms because of inflation so you're like okay well what else could i do with my cash in 1998 well if you took that ten thousand pounds in 1998 and you invested it in a globally diversified portfolio of the best stocks and shares in the world by 2022 and by the way, you'd have to do nothing, okay? Just did nothing. Put it in in 1998, do nothing. Uh, by 2022, that 10,000 pounds would have turned into around 40,000 pounds in real terms, okay? So remember, the cash in real terms was worth about 7,500 pounds. If you'd invested in a globally diversified index tracker, then that would be worth 40,000 pounds. So cash is not a long-term investment. And there's charts that run back to the 1800s that show that historically speaking, cash is not an investment. Of course, no one can predict the future. Past performance is not a prediction of future returns. And this is not investment advice. But going back to the evidence-based investing thing, the evidence of what's happened in the past is all you can look at because no one can predict the future. And in the past, cash has been a terrible long-term investment. So I guess, what do I do with my kids' junior stocks and shares, ISA? I've just given it away there because I said stocks and shares. Uh, yeah, my kids don't hold cash. They don't have a piggy bank storing cash, but they do have a junior stocks and shares ISA. And the reason is because cash in the long term historically has been a terrible investment. I don't want them to be losing money in real terms. So they're invested in a junior stocks and shares ISA. But I think there's a few things to consider here. I, I guess as well, like cash for short term. And by short term, I mean like less than five years. Uh, we've talked about this on YouTube before, but in, in investing, if you're going to invest in stocks and shares, you probably ought to do it for five years or more, any shorter than that. And you need to have a think about what the best option is. Uh, and that is, again, an evidence-based data-driven decision, which shows that historically speaking, uh, if you invest for more than five years, you're very unlikely to lose money. But less than five years, things get a bit different. But my kids are really young. And I'm guessing the person who asked this question's kids were really young as well. So their investment time frame is definitely more than five years. So yeah, that's why I invest in stocks and shares and not cash for my kids. 
But a few other things that just to be aware of with a junior stocks and shares ISA and Facebook groups, mine and Ed's pet hates. And that's not anything against those who organize them and run them. That's fair play. But I just see some crazy chat inside Facebook groups. So the other day I saw one saying that someone was investing in a junior stocks and shares ISA for their children. Okay, so far so good. So that they could pay the children's school fees. And I'm like, hold on. Hopefully this person knows that great thing about a junior stock and shares ISA is investments tax free, et cetera, et cetera. Slight downside that you need to be aware of is that you, you can't get the money until they're 18. And when the kids are 18, they get control of the money. So in, like, unless it's for university fees, maybe, but it's fed specifically for school fees. So, so someone's just nearly got there, but unfortunately in for a bit of a shock because yeah, I think a junior stocks and shares ISA is a terrible way to pay school fees because you can't get it out until they're 18. I don't know. What's your thoughts? I'm getting a bit ranty here already. <laughs> no, absolutely. Too. I think, uh, yeah, yeah, stocks and shares ISAs uh, all the way. I mean, I don't, I don't have kids, so I can't answer the kid element, but everything you said there is perfectly sensible. And yeah, I don't have any, any cash, cash ISAs. I just have stocks and shares ISAs, just like you, in a globally diversified portfolio. Um, I mean, obviously, Cash is important in some ways, you know, you'll need, you need some sort of liquidity if you ever need some, you know, for emergency funds, et cetera. But, uh, but yeah, for actual long-term investing, yeah, stocks and shares all the way. hundred percent. Like great point about you do, you do need some cash, like cash has its value. And that's like one of the big things that we teach on the wellbeing course is that, you know, like when you're resuscitating a patient, all of us know that you need to sort out the airway before you sort out the breathing, because there's a logical order to resuscitation and finances is no different. So we have a medics money algorithm, which just shows you a logical way to approach your finances. So you don't do the, the investing equivalent of working on the breathing before you've opened the airway, which is clearly going to be futile, unfortunately. So there's a logical order and it's just like tiny little things like that person on Facebook. Yeah, great. Jocks and shares ISA for my children. Great idea. And I'm going to use the money to pay their school fees. It's like, oh, terrible idea. You haven't, you've nearly got there, but not quite. And there was a ton of people in the comments just saying, oh, great. Yeah, stocks and shares. Love it. Yeah, I'm going to buy S&P 500 for my kids and fund their school fees with it. It's like, mm, just need to be aware of the limitations, pros and cons in everything. I guess the other thing to mention about kids investing as well is, and you might want to cover your ears here, mate, because there is something which is way more tax efficient than a junior ISA for your children's future. And that is, of course, a children's pension, because this is literally like there's several ways where you can get free money from the government. You know, we talked about lifetime ISA, there is pensions in general, pensions tax relief is essentially free money from the government. Uh, but this is genuinely free money because your kids can have a pension and you or anyone can put in up to £2,880 a year at the moment, at time of recording, and the government will literally add £720 to that for free, which takes you up to £3,600 every year into a pension. And I know about this. I've known about it for a long, long time, but I've decided I don't want to do it for my kids. And Ed's probably cringing because I'm burning possible tax relief here. But the sort of like, don't let the tax tail wag the dog. Like if I'm thinking about my kids, right? Do I want my kids to get some money from their junior stocks and shares ISA when they're 18? Uh, you know, like let's say they get 10,000 pounds at 18. I think 10,000 pounds when you're 18 is way more useful than 100,000 pounds when you retire. Like I don't think my kids are going to go when they retire. Oh yeah, I've got a massive pension because my dad invested in a junior pension for me um i don't think they're going to find that as rewarding as having ten thousand pounds when they are 18 so i'm aware of this literal free money and i've decided that i'm not going to use it but probably worth mentioning i guess the other thing as well is like if you are going to use an isa to pay for your kids school fees just use your own isa perfect you can get the money out when you want no problems unlike a junior isa where the kids can only get the money out when they're 18. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Okay, so yeah, obviously not advice, but think about like evidence-based investing, look at the evidence, realize that the evidence shows that historically in the long term, cash has been a terrible investment. Realize that there is an asset class which historically has outperformed all others and do that if you want. Think about kids' pension. Also, maybe just like I come across some people with a bear trust as well. If you've got 
wealthy parents who are looking to, you know, give your kids money, bear trust, have a look at it. And I guess like, I, I like Genius Stocks and Shares ISA, but in some ways, you could argue that they're a bit pointless unless you've maximized out your own ISA and you don't want to do a bear trust. So I don't know. What's your thoughts, mate? Well, I mean, I think it's important to um, to maximise your your ISA first, absolutely. But you know, it's it's um, everyone's put everyone's circumstances are different. You know, you've got to do what's what's kind of right for you. But you know, definitely bear in mind that you know, you do have twenty thousand pound ISA allowance and a nine thousand pound junior ISA allowance, uh, and it's all very useful for uh, for your investment planning. Yeah, definitely. Just make sure that you're aware of the limitations, you thought it through, and that really what I'm saying is here: make sure you've like know all the facts and have a good plan and just think about it like in an algorithm way. There's a logical way to improve your finances and you need to make sure that you follow that logical route. Okay. The first question that we took live on stage was from one of the audience members. Um, and it was a great question and something that we see tons of people get really confused about. And it was, how do I claim the tax back? on my NHS pension. And for context, I think at that point in the presentation, you were talking about tax <laughs> for a change. Um, so that was what kind of prompted that excellent question. Yeah, absolutely. So what, what, basically, I had a slide about what types of employment expenses are tax deductible. So for us as doctors, the, the classic, the key one is our professional fees, our subscriptions, our Royal College exams, and, and so on. So I talked about that. But there are kind of four specific categories of expenses that are, are allowed uh, and then the general rule after that and the first one is professional fees and subscriptions but the second one was any payments to an occupational pension scheme so i mentioned that to the audience that you know the nhs pension is something you can claim the tax but or you get a tax deduction for uh, and the question was a good one was you know well, how do i go about action and how do i actually claim the tax back on nhs pension um, and the good news is you don't really need to do anything at all because it's all done automatically for you as a hospital doctor via your payslip. Basically, you'll get your gross salary. So if you look at your payslip, you should see your, your gross pay. You should see your um, NHS pension that has come out. And then you should then see a taxable income because, your, as I say, your NHS pension, that's tax deductible. So they take your gross salary, they remove the pension contribution, and then they tax what's left over. So that bit, they'll, they'll apply the income tax rates to, okay? So, you know, great question, but, but good news is, as I say, it's all done automatically. They won't tax your pension. They will ensure you get tax relief for it via your, via your payroll. So, so it's all done automatically. It's so nothing to worry about. And also, I think like maybe the confusion arrives, uh, arises because the way that your NHS pension is taxed or the tax relief thereon is a bit different to like a private pension, for example. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there will be people out there who have their pension contributions taken off the salary just the way that we are, we do. But you also do have private pensions, SIPs, etc., where you you personally invest some money into your pension pot, and that tax relief is different because nobody's going to you know help you out with that one. You know, you're not going to be paying that money via your your payslip. You know, that's not going to go out your your wages or your salary. So, yeah, that is that is taxed differently. You have to claim back the the tax relief on that. But the NHS pension, we are in that position whereby we don't have to do anything in addition. It just comes out of our payslip and off it goes and the tax is taken care of. Awesome. Okay. The next question, there's a bit of a story to this because like I, I love doing medics money. Um, I, I don't love giving talks to loads of people on stage. I kind of like doing a podcast because it doesn't seem like there's thousands of people listening, but there are. So just try and forget about that fact. But this next person uh, came up to me and she was a single mum who was nearly qualified as a obs and gynae consultant. So I've got kids and I'm not a single parent, so I cannot imagine how difficult that is. So that's awesome. And she just told me two or three things well, that she had used medics money that had really, really helped her finances, which like, let's be honest, the finances must be pretty tricky because childcare costs are insane. Being a single parent must be super difficult. So I absolutely love that kind of aspect of it, just to see that all this time and effort that we put in is helping 
our colleagues who in turn are amazing human beings who are helping patients every single day. So I found this so rewarding, but the cut of this question was that this person had been getting less money in their pay slip than they expected. Absolute disaster if you're a single parent and cash flow is tight. So first, their first thought was I use Ed's uh, tax code guide and check the tax code. And shock horror, the tax code was correct. I mean, first time ever, absolute miracle. But anyway, so then they were like, well, this tax code is correct. So what else could be the problem? And what the actual problem was, this won't be a shock horror to anyone. NHS payroll had made a mistake as a surprise to absolutely no one. No offense to our colleagues who work in payroll, but definitely a bit accident prone, those guys. So what happened was basically they hadn't received their uh, extra pay for their nighttime banding sort of supplement bit. And as a result, they realized that that's where the shortfall was. So they successfully got payroll to pay them that money. And that money, which was like the extra payment that they should have been receiving for their night shift, came in one big hit like it always does the thing that i said to them which they hadn't heard of was if that happens to you and and we know that it happens to tons and tons of us because of nhs payroll you need to watch out that you don't get what's called a misallocated arrears issue because this could affect your nhs pension and the tax that you pay on that specifically so essentially as i said they got all of this back pay that they were due and they'd worked out that they were due. No one had told them, but they'd been proactive about it and got it themselves. It all arrived in one big hit. And that can cause you to get what's called a misallocated arrears error with your NHS pension, which can result in you paying way too much tax. And of course, this is pensionable pay because it's part of your regular hours of employment and the rules about what is pensionable and what isn't are in some ways complex. But an, an oversimplification would be that up to 10 PAs for a consultant is pensionable. For junior doctors, I think it's up to 40 hours. And for GPs, it's an absolute mess. Um, <laughs> but yeah, check out what is and isn't pensionable. But the pay was pensionable. It all arrived in one big hit. So they just need to make sure they don't get a misallocated arrears. And you're thinking, how do I get check that I haven't done this? We have a YouTube video on it. I think it's called Three or NHS Pension Mistakes Are Costing You Millions. And it just shows you how to work out if you've got this problem. Uh, and, and more importantly, what to do about it but i just kind of love that story because it just shows that what we're doing is is helping people and hopefully that helped that person i'm sure it did yeah absolutely i say a great great story and uh, yeah glad we could help yeah regrettably as i said in the introduction the vast majority of questions for you were about national insurance which is my least favorite topic but is incredibly important and you had a slide in there about national insurance, which was basically outlining a situation where if you had more than one employer, you might have overpaid. Wow. Did that hit the hit the button? Because you just got bombarded with national insurance questions for about an hour while I was just chatting about, you know, hearing nice stories and talking a bit about how I invest my kids, junior stocks and shares ISA. So do you want to give us the national insurance lowdown? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, luckily I... I... I'm very happy to talk about national insurance. I'll talk about it all day long. So just just for you, Tommy, we'll do a bit on national insurance. Um, it did, yeah, as, as you said, it did raise a lot of questions. We had one from the audience. We then had quite a lot of, well, I had quite a lot of afterwards asking about national insurance. We also, they recently sent out an email about national insurance and got quite a lot of emails about it as well. So it's clearly a topic that people want to know more about and have lots of questions about. Um, and as you say, the main key thing is you may be overpaying national insurance if you have more than one employer okay um national insurance is different to income tax in that unlike income tax for national insurance there are separate limits for jobs with different employers okay you've got to assume that there's no connection between the employers um but if you have different employers it may be that you're overpaying national insurance because there are separate national insurance limits for each job so if you work for a different employer and receive less than twelve thousand five hundred and seventy pounds then no national insurance should be payable. So if you locum, for, if you do your main job for one trust and you locum for a different trust and you earn less than £12,570, you shouldn't really be paying national insurance on that amount, okay? Um, so we've got a lot of questions about from people saying, well, you know, in what circumstances would I overpay? How do I know if I've overpaid? What do I do about it if, I, if I've overpaid? Uh, which are all fantastic questions. We do have a blog about it, our National Insurance blog. I've tried to make it 
make sure I've made it as simple as I can, but you know, obviously do do ask away, you know, email us if you have any questions about it. But essentially there's sort of three main areas where you may have overpaid, okay? So as I say, the first one is you're the main employer, but you're looking for another employer and you earn less than £12,570 from that job or, or jobs. You know, I've got a friend who, um, well, now, now is a consultant in, in Worthing, but he used to, as a registrar, look them all over the place, all over different trusts all around the, the South Coast. Uh, and he ended up getting quite a lot of national insurance back because he'd look them for one area and, and get paid three thousand pounds, and then a second area, the employer will pay only four thousand pounds. They're all charging national insurance, and that shouldn't be the case. So he actually got quite a lot of money back. Okay, so think about this: if you're working for one employer, you're looking in for another, are they charging you national insurance? Okay. As I say, they have to be totally separate employers, okay? So not different hospitals for the same employer, not where you're working for the same employer via, but via a bank system instead at the same hospital, you know, have to be separate separate employments, okay? If you're in the situation whereby you have a, a main employer and you're looking for different employers, but you earn more than £12,570 from those other employers, um, if in total you earn more than 50000 270 pounds it may be the case that you're still that you're overpaying because there is actually um and what the revenue called the annual maxima um sadly it doesn't mean there's actually a proper maximum maximum of national insurance you should pay as and there's no cap but you should only be paying a certain amount of your salary as eight percent national insurance as opposed to then the rest at two percent okay so if you have multiple employers charging you eight percent on your salary then there's a good chance if you own in total over 50,270 50, pounds that you are overpaying again, okay? And finally, and this is really complicated, if you have, basically, if you have employment income and then you have self-employment income, it may be that, again, if in total you're getting more than 50,270 pounds, if you're paying 8% national insurance as an employee and then class 4 national insurance on your profits at in for some employment with six percent you know again are you overpaying should you actually be paying at two percent on some of that income okay if you only have one employer so i've got one employer for example it is very very unlikely that you're going to be overpaying national insurance that the problem comes if you've got multiple employers because they won't know you know there's a good chance that they just don't know what your salary is for the other employer you know why would they know that so they may be applying these national insurance rates incorrectly because they just don't know what, what's going on with your circumstances and as i say if you are both employed and self-employed again there's a good chance you may be paying a bit too much national insurance because you'll be paying some on your salary and some on your profits okay appreciate this is a little bit mind-boggling i also appreciate you know you guys don't want to go away and and do calculations for national insurance, but just think about these sort of general points. You know, are you locoming for another employer, but earning less than twelve thousand five hundred seventy pounds? If so, check your pay slips. Is the national insurance showing up there? If so, you probably you probably have overpaid. Do you have more than one employer, but all your salaries are over twelve thousand five hundred seventy pounds? If yes, have a look at those locum pay slips, check them, and think to yourself: Well, am I paying at eight percent? Or am I paying at two percent? You know, you should you should be able to work out roughly how much national insurance you're paying on that pay slip. And if, as I say, if you're earning over fifty thousand two hundred seventy pounds in total, it may be that you are overpaying. And then finally, as I say, if you are both employed and self-employed, what's the total of your salary and your taxable profits? Are they going to be over fifty thousand two hundred seventy pounds? If yes, again, are you paying too much national insurance? Okay. If you think that you've overpaid, then I would recommend calling the National Insurance Contribution Office. You can also write to HMRC. Uh, if you do that, they basically want to know certain details, which I don't think actually I have put in the blog, so I need to get my Matthew, my, my uh, colleague, to update that. But basically, they want to know your, your name, address, your national insurance number, and what tax years you may have overpaid him. Some people ask about deadlines. Well, you know, if I have overpaid national insurance, what is the deadline? Well, interest, interestingly enough, if you've overpaid national insurance because you have more than one job there is no time limit you can go back as, as long as you want to get that repayment okay there is a limit if there's been an, an error if, if for some reason you know your payroll have made a mistake other than because you've got more than one job or for example you um, let's say you, you you've kind of retired but you reach your state pension age but you're still paying national insurance these things were you know errors uh, the time limit is six years but as I say there's no limit 
if you've overpaid because you have more than one job. And I don't think there's a limit either if you've got jobs, employment and self-employment. Okay. So I hope that kind of helps. As I say, we've got a lot of questions about it on the day. We got we actually had, we had quite a lot of emails about it over the weekend. Um, hopefully that makes some sense as to when you might be overpaying your national insurance. Yeah, thanks to everybody that asked these fascinating national insurance questions. It is, as I said, it's my most favorite topic that it talks about. But in all seriousness, it's the one that we get the most input about because that is such a common scenario that happens, isn't it? That you have two employers yeah. and um, like like all of this, nobody national insurance is not going to sort itself out. I don't believe that HMRC are that proactive about this. No, no, absolutely. And I mean, for most people, most people in the UK, they've got one employer. It's very rare for national insurance to be overpaid or for there to be a problem with national insurance because it's not like, as I say, it's not like income tax where there are various deductions. National insurance is reasonably straightforward. You know, they don't take into account anything. They don't take into account your student loan or your, your pension contributions or your expenses. They just work out what national insurance you should pay based on some bands and some percentages, which are 8, 0%, then 8%, then 2% for employees. 0%, 6%, 2% for if you're self-employed. So they just work that out. And for most people, you've got one job. It's very rare for that to be a problem. So they don't really kind of think about it, to be honest. But if you do have multiple employments, you know, why would employer one necessarily know what your salary is in empl you know, employment two? They just work it out separately. And as I say, that could lead to problems and overpayments. So have a think about it. If you do work lots of local shifts for different employers or you're self-employed somehow, just have a think about it. You know, are you overpaying your national insurance? Because as somebody just said, uh, HMRC are unlikely to, to look into that for you. Awesome. Okay. The next question actually came from a YouTube fan. I don't know if they listen to the podcast, but they definitely watch YouTube because on YouTube, a lot of our content is more about investing. And that's because we love investing and we love investing because of that graph that I showed you in the answer to the first question, which shows the returns of the greatest companies in the world versus cash, uh, which historically cash has not been a great investment at all. But the question was, we often talk about investing in a globally diversified index tracker. And we don't say what specific one we invest in, because that would be investment advice. But the question was, if I buy the S&P 500, would we consider that a globally diversified index tracker? And the short answer to this, well, the first thing to say is, of course, not investment advice. This is just what we do and you need to make your own decisions. But the short answer to that question is no, I do not consider the S&P 500 a globally diversified index tracker. And if that's like a foreign language to you, here's a quick kind of recap about what we're talking about. So we talked about why we don't hold all of our money in cash. And that's because of that first graph I showed you today. And then if you're looking to invest your money, you've got a lot of options. You could buy individual shares yourself. You could buy what's called a fund. And a fund is a collection of shares all wrapped up into one kind of bundle. And it's a single investment. And you just buy that single investment. The benefit of a fund over buying individual shares is a fund is generally, but not always, depending on which one you buy, more diversified. And diversify or diversification is kind of the key thing to understand. They say that diversification is the only free lunch in investing. And what that basically means is that, you know, you do not need to buy individual shares at the individual shares and rely on reading the Financial Times or predicting the future. You can just diversify your investments by a little bit of everything or a little bit of what you choose. Um, and that will give you a as good or better outcome, historically speaking, because past performance does not predict future performance to keep everyone happy. So, so that's kind of like a fund. And if you're looking to buy a fund, you can have an active fund where a highly paid and super expensive fund manager tries to buy investments that they think will perform well. Or you can have a passive fund, which generally just buys an, what's called an index. And again, an index is just a collection of shares. So in this, in this case, the person was asking the S&P 500, which is essentially the 500 biggest companies in America, all wrapped up into one fund. You buy that fund, the S&P 500 tracker, and that's your lot. And active versus passive investing 
is probably one of the biggest things that you need to understand in investing because you would have thought that highly paid fund managers that are in the Sunday papers every week in the money section would outperform essentially just buying a bit of everything and doing nothing. But actually all the data, oh, okay, not all the data, most of the data shows that passive approach using a low cost, globally diversified tracker outperforms these highly paid star in inverted commas fund managers the majority of the time. And more importantly, the longer you invest for, the more chance that the passive strategy is going to work better. And that's great news for investors that are doing it themselves, because essentially all you've got to do is buy the right fund and do nothing for 20 or 30 years, and you're going to get wealthy. Not, not fast, but you're going to get wealthy slowly, historically speaking. So yeah, is the S&P 500 tracker, May, May, do you think that helps to sort of put this in context before I move on? Yeah, no, I thought that made perfect sense. Yeah, I fell under pressure because I almost understood the answers to the your national insurance question. So you explained it well. So I hope that I've explained investing in four sentences there. So S&P 500 is essentially the 500 biggest companies in America. You can buy it in an, in an investment, just one single investment, super easy. Is that a globally diversified tracker? My answer is no. And the reason is several fold, really. First off, the S&P 500 is what's called a capitalization weighted index, which essentially means the bigger the company, the more of the index that company represents. So at the time of recording, if you brought an S&P 500 tracker, you would have 30% of your investments in just seven companies. And those seven companies are Microsoft, Apple, Nvidia, Alphabet, which is Google, Amazon, uh, Meta, which is Facebook, and Tesla. So I do not consider having 30% of my investment in just those seven companies. I don't consider that diversified. And remember, diversification is the only free lunch in investing. You know, diversifying your investments mean that the chance of success in general increases. And that's really what we want in investing. We want to maximize our chance of success and minimize our chance of losing money. So that's one reason why I don't consider the S&P 500 a globally diversified tracker. I guess at the moment, it's a bit like when I was, I was at a party the other day with my kids and it was getting late and they were having a great time. And then I came along and said, look, guys, it's time to go home or you're going to be really tired tomorrow and you're not going to be able to like play football or whatever tomorrow. It was actually netball. And of course, they didn't want to go home because they're having a great time. And I was like the bad guy coming along saying, you got to go home. At the moment, if you say, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't consider the S&P 500 a globally diversified tracker, you're like the bad guy because over the last 10 years, the S&P 500 has been massively outperforming almost any other index. And then you're thinking, well, why would I not buy it? And of course, you'll make your own decision because this isn't investment advice. But I've already explained one reason why I don't consider it diversified because actually a lot of it's concentrated. Another thing to do if you're going to buy the S&P 500 and that's going to be your only investment is have a look at the lost decade. So between 2000, because at the moment, S&P 500, it's like a great party. Everything's going well. Uh, no downsides. Right. But uh, between 2000 and 2010, the S&P 500 just went sideways. You could have bought it in 2010 for the same price as it was in 2000. So you could have potentially lost a lot of potential gains in that time to so have a look at the lost decade. Think about what I said about diversification. Think about whether you're happy to have 30% of your investments in just seven companies. And also those seven companies are predominantly information technology companies, you know, Microsoft, Apple, Nvidia. Think about that. Yeah. And I feel like I'm the person telling you to go to bed early when the parties were going really well. But yeah, I do not just hold the S&P 500. Uh, and that's not to say that I don't invest in America at all. That would be ridiculous. But I just think that diversification is the only free lunch of investing. And if that is what you believe as well, then the only logical conclusion to that is to buy a small slice of everything in the world in proportion to their relative makeup of the market and do nothing. If I just held the S&P 500, I might be tempted to make silly decisions like look at it go down and think, oh, my goodness, I've, only, I've got 30 percent of my money in like seven companies. Maybe I should sell. I am 100 percent comfortable with my asset allocation, as in how my assets are spread around. So I've got about 62% in America. I've got about 8% in Europe. I've got only 4% in, Amer in, in the UK, which is how much of the global stock market the UK index makes up. 
So do your own research, not advice. Mate, what do you think? Because it's hard to have an investing discussion with you because we basically just do the same thing. What we want is someone like Dr. Albiati, who came on our Bitcoin podcast recently because he does something <laughs> way different. And therefore, it's a bit more, you know, it's a bit more controversial. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think we are we are very very similar in what we do. I always feel like I'm quite I'm quite boring when it comes to my investing strategy, which is exactly the same as, as you do. Very very diversified, you know, globalized. You know, these these funds that I invest in that just you know take away all the all the pressure. Passive investing just put some money into a, a globally diversified tracker and then kind of just leave it alone, really. But it's it's a really good point about the the, the making about the S and P. I mean, they're there's certainly levels of diversification, aren't there? So you you want to be diversifying by about globally. You want to be diversifying by sector. You want to be diversifying by company. So the S and P is definitely you know up from just investing in individual companies. Definitely better than that. But as you say, it's very heavily tech based. It's very heavily obviously America based. So yeah, again, not advice. Everyone's got to make their own their own views and what they should be doing. But, uh, but yeah, there's definitely ways to uh, increase the levels of, of diversification. Yeah, I just want to loop back on something you said there that your investments are boring. That is exactly, to me, that just shows that your investments are matched to your risk tolerances and your goals, right? My investments are so boring. I hardly ever look at them, they're so boring, uh, but they're just in the background, churning away. And historically speaking, if we go back to that first chart that I showed right at the start of this, you know, that they're going to make me wealthy slowly over time. Uh, and if you find your investments exciting and you're checking them all the time and you're buying and selling them, that, in my opinion, is a sign that you're doing it wrong. If you find them boring, like I, me and Ed find our stocks and shares boring, that's fine. In fairness to Abdullah, who came on the Bitcoin podcast, he said that he finds his Bitcoin investment boring as well because it's a bit too <laughs> stable and not volatile enough for him. So if you find your investments boring, happy days. And I think the other thing to think about is investing is a game of risk versus reward. And if you put all your eggs in the S&P 500, your potential reward is potentially greater than if you put it in everything. OK, but your potential risk is that you get another lost decade or that suddenly AI doesn't t turn out to be the great thing that it is. And then suddenly, you know, Microsoft, Apple and Nvidia shares have gone down the pan. You've got 30 percent of your wealth in just those seven stocks and you're taking potentially taking extra risk without getting additional rewards. So I love that investment portfolios are boring. I guess it's kind of easy for us as well, because we've been doing it a long time. So we know what we do works and that makes you more confident. But I definitely remember when I first started investing, and it was terrifying and you just didn't know who to trust or, or what, what was the best strategy. But once you've done the research and worked out an evidence-based investing strategy that doesn't rely on predicting the future, doesn't rely on gambling, uh, then investing is boring. And that's just how the way I like it. Mate, I think that's, I think that's, that's it. it. Yeah, absolutely. That's it for the questions for today. Awesome. Well, I hope that was helpful. I just want to say as well, thanks to the Royal College of Obs, Obs and Gynie for inviting us along because it was really great to, you know, that they dedicated some time at what was a really important conference for them to talking about, you know, the financial health of their members. So yeah, there's a several world colleges that kind of are proactive and work with us and support us. So World College of Jobs and Gynae, World College of Emergency Medicine, World College of Surgeons. I think that's it, mate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're the key, the key ones other world colleges we are of course open to working with you and helping you promote the financial health of your members but we have approached every single world college and those are the ones that got back to us and supported us so if your world college isn't on the list uh, give them a little nudge and if we can help we'll be delighted to you gotta jump on a plane uh because you're going on holiday i just got yep. back from holiday so i've got a ton of washing to do uh i'm on my fourth load of the day luckily it's a nice day so it's a good dying day so on that really exciting you know, dream life uh, bombshell. I think we should wrap it up. <laughs> we should also insert some kind of disclaimer like tax allowances and rates subject to change. It's not investment advice. Past performance does not predict future returns. Any other disclaimers that you want to put in? No, those are the key ones, aren't they? I mean, like, um, I think, in fairness, you did say about the investing one anyway, Fine. but it's always good to put it in anyway, isn't it? And the tax, yeah, you know, I mean, Christ, if they change national insurance again, I think I'm going to. I'd be so sad. It just keeps changing every five minutes. <laughs> like, you know, Not as sad as I will minute. be because we'll have to oh, yeah. record yet another national insurance podcast. 
That's the one. Thanks for listening, guys. Take, Take care. care.